All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorevsky, and I'll be your host for today. Today, we're kicking off an exciting 10 event series exploring amazing locations around the world with the Darwin 200. So this is all just a warm up to the epic Darwin 200 expedition that will see us following a tall ship around the world as it traces Darwin's incredible voyage of the Beagle, allowing us to broadcast live from some of the coolest places on the planet. So in today's event, we're going to explore the incredible island of South Georgia, one of Darwin 200's future stops. We're going to meet members of the South Georgia Heritage Trust, uh, some of the team from Roots and Shoots. We're going to announce winners from previous contests, play some live Kahoot for prizes, announce another contest, and so much more. So buckle up. This is going to be a pretty awesome live event today. So it is my great pleasure right now to introduce Stuart McPherson. So you may have remember meeting Stu earlier. Uh, we've done a few Darwin 200 events on some amazing test voyages traveling around the UK. We had some amazing stops, some check-ins uh, during that voyage. And today we're going to continue. We've got Stu joining us uh, live from the UK. He's a biologist, an explorer, an author, and the project leader for the Darwin 200. So let's bring him in with us right now. Hey, Stu, how are you doing today? It's lovely to speak to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And I hope you're really going to enjoy this event. I think so, Stu. It's going to be uh, a really great time. We've got tons of content to share today. The classrooms are going to get to meet some incredible people. Uh, and then I'm excited to see some of those contest winners and to announce the, the contest we have coming up. Well, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just share my screen, then you can quickly uh, see my presentation. That's great. All right, we'll let you take over for a bit, Stu. And then after Stu presents, we're going to do a little Kahoot action. So uh, I'll share those links when the time comes with the classrooms. Wonderful. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'll, um, I'll just share my screen now and then, then we can get started. So everyone, my presentation today is on an introduction for our event today is on South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, which has got to be one of the most exciting and amazing islands in the whole world. Um, if you don't know where South Georgia is located, it's right down in the Southern Ocean, right down here in the bottom of, of the ocean, uh, uh, bottom of the world, down here by Antarctica. It's this little slither of land, this very thin, thin slither of land over here, capped with ice. South Georgia um, is, is about the size of Wales. It's a long, narrow island covered with glaciers across the interior. So you might think that it's a cold, icy island without wildlife, but you couldn't be more wrong. Just quickly, here's South Georgia up in the north and the chain of South Sandwich Islands down, on, down towards the south uh, east. The island is covered with glaciers. I'm sure you've learned about glaciers in your, in your geography class at school, but glaciers are gigantic ice masses that flow down from the mountains into the waters. It's cold, it's icy, so you'd be it'd be understandable to think that there wouldn't be many animals, but you couldn't be more wrong. These islands are absolutely concentrated with penguins and, and sea uh, marine mammals during the summer months. In fact, these are some of the most important breeding sites for seabirds and marine mammals anywhere in the world. Millions upon millions of penguins and seals migrate here every single year. Um, so you can see gigantic colonies like this. This is one species of penguin called the king penguin. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that the chicks, the babies, the young ones, they almost look like brown hot water bottles. They're often described like that because they're, they're soft and fluffy and fat as they grow and, and fledge. Well, I'm not going to tell you why there's so many animals. I'm gonna leave that for Pat later in the talk today. So I want you to start thinking why there should be so many animals congregating together in a cold, icy island down towards Antarctica. So have a think. But as you'll see in, in the presentations and the talks that you're going to hear today, mi literally millions of birds and, and, and seals group together, forming these immense colonies. So start trying to have a think why so many animals should, should group together. So one of the animals that, that's very prominent in South Georgia are the elephant seals. These are one of the largest seal species in the whole world. And the bulls come together on the beaches and they fight over the females. So this is a boy, 
a bull, and these are the females, the girls. The females group together in harems. That means basically a group. And the, ma the males, which are called beach masters, battle together on, on the shores to protect and fight over the girls. So um, the girls sit there watching while the big males fight and battle. They actually use their heads a bit like sledgehammers. They've got quite sharp canine teeth and they battle against each other. And they can inflict pretty big injuries um, with their teeth. They can scar uh, the, the, the throats and the necks of the others. So these are two juvenile or sub-adult sub males um, about to start battling. The beaches are also filled with about 4 million fur seals. These little seals um, bound along a bit, a bit like dogs in many ways, and are really, really energetic along the beaches. Um, there, there's, say, millions across the island as a whole. And this is a pup here. They're soft, they're fluffy, but don't let their, their, um, their appearance distract you. They can race up towards you and give you a nip. So you've got to be a bit careful when you're exploring the beaches of South Georgia. You've got to give all of the animals uh, an amount of safe, safe distance and respectful distance from them. One every few hundred thousand fur seals is bright blonde. They're called leukistic individuals. Here's a little photo of one here. Um, the, the typical coloration is dark brown, dark blackish, but every once in a while, you'll see these bright, bright blonde ones that stand out on the beaches. So they're quite rare, but the color doesn't seem to affect them. They breed and, and they, they live normal lives. So they're, they're quite interesting to spot as you go along. Well, as I mentioned earlier, South Georgia is sub-Antarctic. It's in the cold, icy latitudes of, uh, of the Southern Ocean. But that doesn't mean that there's no plants on the island. Many pockets of, of the coastal areas of South Georgia are covered with tussock vegetation. And this is very, very, very important for the, for the, for the animal life, as you'll see in, in Pat's presentation later. But there's also lots of endemic insects that live inside the, uh, the vegetation. And many of these are found nowhere else in the world. There's, for example, several flightless insects. And when you think about islands, when you think about the stormy, wild conditions down here on South Georgia, many of the little insects that live on the islands, if they have wings, they get carried and blown by the wind and blown out onto the open ocean and die. So several species have actually evolved to, to lack wings, which is an advantage because they're less likely to be blown off South Georgia. So there's some really, really interesting insects and invertebrates on the island that we're only really just beginning to know. There's, there's some incredible little micro ecosystems within that tussock grass that you're going to hear about later. South Georgia is very famous for being home to one of the greatest concentrations of whales anywhere in the world. The waters around the islands traditionally were, were, were very rich in whales and they come down to the Southern Ocean for one specific reason. Believe it or not, the biggest animals in the world actually eat tiny little animals called krill. And they swim down, the, the whales swim down to the Southern Ocean to catch vast, vast numbers, huge numbers of krill, uh, which they can catch and filter with their special mouths that have baleen plates. As you may know from the South Georgia pack that was sent in your Hansen boxes earlier in the year, um, South Georgia was home to immense whaling stations up to 3,000 whalers worked on the islands up into the 1960s. So this is quite a sad part of the island's history, but it's part of the history that we, that, that that's just part of fact and part of reality. So it's important to understand it. The whaling stations today are, are crumbling and breaking down, but they they offer a fascinating reminder of this, this time of whaling. And you can still see these enormous tanks of whale oil, um, where the whalers used to, to collect the oil to export right the way around the world. And believe it or not, some of the tanks still drip whale oil 40 years on. I actually went to South Georgia a few years ago to film a, a TV series for, for the BBC. And um, when I was there, I literally, this is my hand here, literally seeing some of that whale oil just all dripping from the tanks. Well, there's lots of amazing secrets that we're just beginning to understand across South Georgia one of which is the extraordinary diversity of marine life that occur around the islands. Of course, on the island itself, the, the huge populations of penguins and seals are really, really impressive, but we're just beginning to explore and understand the full diversity of, of marine life 
that's found in the shallow waters around South Georgia. And some amazing discoveries have been made, especially in the South Sandwich Islands, the archipelago next, next to South Georgia, where deep sea vents, black smoke events, have been found right down deep in the ocean, on the ocean floor. These, these are basically like, you can compare them to volcanic vents underwater. And many, many communities of unique animals have just been found within the few, last few years. And believe it or not, literally just a few years ago, a lava lake was discovered on one of these volcanic islands in the South Sandwich Archipelago. There's only seven lava lakes in the world, and uh, one of them was found atop of one of the South, South Sandwich Islands. So it's quite interesting to see today. Well, I'm going to hand back over to, to um, Joe now for, for an overview. I think we've got a Kahoot quiz coming up. So I hope you listen carefully, and um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. All right, Stu, that, uh, I mean, South Georgia looks absolutely incredible. I wonder, just a quick question, how, how many times have you been able to visit? Well, I've been very fortunate to visit South Georgia uh, twice um, over the past few years. And um, every time, both times I've been, it's been amazing and absolutely left me speechless, just with the diversity and the concentrations of wildlife. All right. Well, as promised, we do have a little Kahoot quiz here up and ready to go. So this might be new to some groups. I'm going to share a link up here. It's kahoot.it. So if you head over to that link, it's going to ask you for a PIN number. And I'm going to share that PIN uh, with you right now on my screen. So here we go. Let's get that front and center. Now, once you put that PIN number in, it's going to generate a name for you, a cool animal name. So the PIN for today is 763-0537. If you have one-to-one -one technology at your seat, that's awesome. You can play right at your desk. If not, your teacher could pop it up uh, at the front of the classroom and you guys could shout out your answers. If your mobile device or tablet is handy, you could even just scan that QR code uh, and that'll bring you in ready to go. I see classrooms joining. I see students joining. We've got the glowing lobster, the yellow jaguar, the sturdy goat. So we'll give another few seconds to get a few more groups in. And then at the end of this, there'll be a, a top three podium uh, and send me a message if your class was one or one of your students or your class was in that top uh, three podium spot. So three questions today, uh, true and false and multiple choice. You have 20 seconds to get that question answered. Uh, if it's right, you get points. The quicker you get it in, the more points you get. If you get it in really fast and it's wrong, well, we got nothing for you. You got to get that right answer in there and the quicker, the better. So we've got lots of students, lots of classes joining. We'll give it another maybe 20 seconds before we get things started. Once I see those names slow down, I will hit that start button and we will see uh, who comes out on our podium. All right, let's get things going. So first question coming up here, there will be 20 seconds on the clock. What is South Georgia covered with? What did Stu say at the beginning? Is it covered in forests, glaciers, wetlands, or deserts? So let's see if we can get that answer in nice and quickly. A couple more seconds on the clock. All right, no fooling this crew. Most went with glaciers. Very cool. Let's see what that does to our leaderboard. We've got the Amazon cat holding down that top spot. Let's jump to a true and false question. There are no insects that can live on South Georgia. Is that true or is that false? There are no insects that can live. It's just too cold for them to be on South Georgia. Is that true or is that false? All right, we know that that is false. Uh, and it was pretty cool to hear about that, uh, those adaptations, some of them uh, being wingless, so they're not blown right off of the island. And endemic, so found nowhere else in the world. What does that do to our leaderboard? We've got the Amazon cat holding on strong. Our final quiz question, why are whales attracted to the waters around South Georgia? Is it a good place to give birth? 
Are the waters nice and warm? Do the cold waters, are they full of their favorite food? Or we just don't really know yet. So what do you think is that right answer? Are they coming down there to give birth? Are the waters just so warm for them? Are the cold waters full of their favorite foods? Or we just don't know yet. All right. Most of our crew went with those cold waters are full of their favorite food. That's absolutely right. Let's shake down our podium here. In third place, we've got the Amazon cat. So we did have some movement. In second place, we've got the sturdy goat. And holding down that top spot, we've got the silver tiger. All right. Great job, crew. Thanks for playing along with us today. And if your classroom is one of those top three spots, one of the students in your classroom, send me a little email afterwards. I'll share my email uh, in the chat as well. All right, Stu, there's our, our, our Kahoot action. Our students did pretty good today. Many, many congratulations on the three winners. We've got $50 or pound um, prizes on Amazon. So please do, don't forget to send across your email address to, to Joe and we'll issue them straight after the, the, the session today. So thank you so much for playing along in the Kahoot quiz. All right, Stu, I know we've got our crew from the South Georgia Heritage Trust joining us next. So I'll let you introduce them and they can take over for a bit. Pleasure, thank you so much. Well, for those that, that, that took part and, and may be aware, um, over the last year, we've sent out 8,000 South Georgia um, resource packs to schools across the UK and beyond. These were made in partnership with the wonderful South Georgia Heritage Trust. And we're very, very honored today uh, to have the team from the South Georgia Heritage Trust giving a presentation and announcing the winners of our competitions. Over the last, uh, last well, six months or so, we've had thousands of schools take part both in the creative writing and the drawing competitions. We've had some amazing entries from drawings of penguins and, and fur seals to, to elephant seals and beyond. So today, you're going to find out who's won the competitions. And perhaps most importantly of all, in addition to the prizes, the winning entries, the first, second and third place entries of both competitions, as well as the 20 runner-ups in both, are actually going to be taken to South Georgia and displayed in the museum down on, on the island. So it's a pretty special, pretty unique prize for your drawings and essays to be taken to the subantarctic and displayed there. So without further ado, I believe we've got um, uh, the wonderful Alison from the South Georgia Heritage Trust to announce the winners. So we'll hand over to Alison. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. It's so great to be here with you all today. And we really enjoyed so much seeing all of your competition entries. Thank you to everybody that took part in it. Uh, and we're so excited to be able to um, offer the prizes that the Don Hansen Charitable Foundation has really kindly donated. Um, so we've got some fantastic prizes. We've got Amazon vouchers. So the first prize, £200, second prize, £150, third prize, £100, and the 20 runner-up prizes in each category of £50. But the fantastic thing that we are able to offer you is um, the winners and the runners-up. We're going to take all of your entries down to the island and we're going to display them in the South Georgia Museum, which our charity runs on the island. And it's right in the middle of all the penguins and seals um, that Stuart's been telling you about. Um, so that's the first time any school children will ever have had their competition entries displayed. And then thousands and thousands of tourists from all around the world will come to the museum and see those winning prizes. So it's a very exciting opportunity. So, okay, let's get on with it and uh, start telling you about who won the runner-up prizes for the drawing competition. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Lovely. So we've got this lovely drawing by Alice Cousins. She's won a, a £50 Amazon voucher. Next one, please. Uh, that's Arthur Cox. Next slide, please. And then we've got Emily Hawkins. Uh, I think that's, sorry, is that Bree Reeve? Erie Reeve, sorry. And then we've got Jackson Harrington. 
Matilda Davies, Noah Joy, Rose Webster, Neve Mostyn, Sienna Goodwin, Sebastian Atwood, Max Sutherland, Isla Urquhart, Alice Old Meadow, uh, Anonymous from Mellor Primary School, <laughs> and I want to just mention the schools actually at this point in time. So uh, the runners up, we had Alice, Arthur, Emily, Edie, uh, Jackson, Matilda, Noah, Rose, Mac and Isla were all from St Mary's Infant School in Frensham. We had uh, Neve and Sienna and Sebastian from Yarlet School and Alice Meadow, Alice Old Meadow from Old Meadow School. And we also had six runners up from Mellor Primary School whose teacher is Emily Russell. Okay, so let's go on to our third place winner. And that was Amelia Morris. And Amelia is from, uh, oh, sorry, I can't remember what school Amelia is from. Okay, let's keep going. Second place, Lottie Joan Brown. Fantastic. Well done, Lottie. And the winner of the £200 Amazon voucher is... George Grierson. Very well done, George. And we thought all of your drawings were just fantastic, so colourful and, and just brilliant. And the tourists and probably the penguins as well are going to absolutely love them. So well done to you. We also had um, the essay competition, of course. So let me just tell you about the, the runner-up prizes for that. And the runners-up for the essays included Lila A, Matilda F, Sienna B, Sophie C from the Hurst Primary School. We had Ben and Jack from Hipsburn Primary School and the rest of the runners were from the Mellor Primary School and their teacher is Emily. Okay, so if we can now move on to the third prize, then the third prize goes to SA27, we don't know who it is from Mellor Primary School, but well done, whoever you are. Second prize goes to Fraser A from the Hurst Primary School. And the first place for the SA competition goes to Alicia from Hurst Primary School. And those winning entries will all be making their way down to South Georgia very soon. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so well done and congratulations. And I hope you enjoy your prizes and that opportunity for your drawings and essays to be seen by all those visitors. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, all of those prize winners. That is quite an honor to have arts displayed in South Georgia for the very first time to be seen by tens of thousands um, of tourists who are going to come uh, and visit. That's pretty incredible. And I'm excited to announce uh, shortly, we'll be announcing a contest for the students who are tuning in today, which I think will be a pretty fun one. Allison, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we should carry on a little bit more and dive a little deeper into the South Heritage Trust. Stu, would you like to announce or introduce our next speaker? With pleasure. Um, thank you so much for, for bringing me back. So thank you again to all of the competition winners. Um, it really was a pleasure judging all of your entries. They were so imaginative and, and so, so inspiring. Um, just one last quick point on that. I think Alison has kindly mentioned that all of the winning schools will receive a photograph of your or your entries on display in South Georgia. So just imagine your drawings heading south down to the subantarctic and your essays heading south to subantarctic. So it's a pretty special um, way to have your, your art and your essays writing displayed. Well, without further ado, I, uh, we've got um, Pat from the South Georgia Heritage Trust giving an overview of the inspiring conservation work that's being undertaken on this subantarctic island. So we'll hand over now to Pat. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for having me along. Um, my name's Pat, Pat Lurcock, and 
I've been probably the most lucky person on the planet who had a job on the island that kept me there for about 25 years, spending about eight months there every year doing government administration work. Well, if you've got to do a paperwork job, you might as well do it somewhere nice. So I was there for 25 years and have seen a lot. And it was very nice seeing all Stuart's photographs reminding me of that very, very wonderful place where I've, um, yeah, I've not been there for a couple of years. World events have been a bit strange, but I'm looking forward to getting back very, very soon. I now work on cruise ships as a guide and take um, the ships and lots and lots of guests down to see the island. So I'm really looking forward now to seeing all your photographs and essays when we visit Grootviken in November and December. So that, yeah, so I've got a history on South Georgia. So I've been very privileged to see a lot of things that are going on. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about uh, some of the other aspects. Um, but first of all, yeah, thanks Stuart for that massive introduction to the island. It is really that spectacular with the, with the scenery and the wildlife. And you asked, why do all the animals go there? Well, um, you've probably all had a little time to think about that. And the answer is really because it's a tiny little island in the middle of a great big cold sea. The cold sea um, can hold a lot more oxygen than warm water. So it's perfect for lots and lots of little things, plants and animals to all grow very quickly. So it's very productive and there's lots and lots of food. So all the big animals go into that area uh, the whales, the penguins, the seals, there's fish as well, and seabirds. They all like to be around in that big ocean to eat all that lovely food. However, when it comes to breeding, they can't breed on the ocean, so they need to find somewhere to go ashore. And South Georgia is pretty well the only little lump of rock in a vast sea, so they all have to go and crowd onto the beaches and to the hillsides there. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of the animals on the shore and explain why South Georgia is so special. It's, um, we've only known about it for less than 250 years, so not many people have visited until quite recently. It's got its own special combination of scenery, plants, animals, and because we've not known about it, man hasn't really visited it and brought in lots of new species and, and introduced anything, so it's still a very special combination of plants and the insects and the animals that live there are all, almost all, those that belong there and should be there. So it hasn't had much time to get spoiled. As Stuart said, it's mainly rock and ice, but around the edges, there's a little green fringe, which is a very useful place for, for, for animals to go in and breed. So um, when they do come ashore, they're all on the edge, either on the beaches like these fur seals or up into the tussock grass that you've seen. So there are all the birds around the area. So that's the prions and petrels like these ones. And if, if you're somebody on the internet who is wondering if I've asked for permission to steal that picture, um, please get in touch because I haven't. But um, yeah, they, the little birds like these, but prions and petrels, they feed at sea, but they need to come ashore to breed and roost. Other seabirds, very similar ones, and Antarctic terns who come onto the shore and lay their eggs in little scrapes on the ground. They're also ducks. Uh, they're not quite so spectacular looking, but still amazing animals. They are, these are the South Georgia pintail. And one of the things that's special about these is you won't find them anywhere else in the world. They're what they call endemic. So they only exist on South Georgia, which means if there's a threat to them there, that's it, they've gone. So it's very important with some of the insects, the plants, and, and these little ducks to make sure that we look after the place. There are no trees. It's quite a strange place. The biggest plant is this tussock grass. So it's a, a tussocky grass that grows to maybe a metre tall. So if you're a bird, you don't really have much option to, to build nests up in trees. And one of the other birds is this little pipit tiny little beautiful little songbird amazing that it manages to survive on such an island but it does all year round and again it's endemic only lives on south georgia nowhere else in the world the tussock makes a really nice habitat for it it um, insulates nicely right through the winter um, so it keeps warm and is a lovely little place for it to breed 
Now, since the island was discovered, people have come in ships to exploit, as we've seen, the seals for their fur and the oil, and the whales for their oil. Fortunately, that's all stopped now, and the whales are recovering, and the seals have recovered fantastically. It's really nice to see that all you have to do is leave them alone, and they get on with it and recover from all the things we've done. Sadly, there are some things that haven't recovered. So um, where man came in, we could only get there by ship, and there were very often shipwrecks. And with their cargo bringing stuff ashore, rodents, rats, and mice got in ashore. Um, so rats got introduced to the island within the last 250 years. But rats can breed very quickly. They only get to they only need to be a few weeks old before they start breeding. They have large litters, and they can have litter after litter a few weeks apart. So that if you only have two rats on an island within a year, there could be a, a, a few hundred. In two years, there could be thousands, and after a, a number of years, the island could have millions of rats on it, which we, we know it did. And they're only limited by the amount they can find to eat and the amount of shelter they can find to survive. Unfortunately, because there are no trees, all the breed, breeding birds live either on the surface or build little burrows like this little diving petrel has done. This is a, a stuffed example that's in the museum on the island and so the egg the eggs are available to rats who love a lovely egg breakfast and so they have made huge inroads and have destroyed the populations of many of these birds which are only just hanging on in little corners that the rats couldn't get to so in 2011 after years of planning the south georgia heritage trust decided that something needed to be done about this and thought maybe it would be possible now, when you've got rats on an island 90 miles long and there's millions of them, you can't put traps out. So we used a slightly different strategy. They bought helicopters with huge hoppers underneath and great big sacks full of poisoned bait. So these little granules are very, very, very attractive to rats. They like these. It's full of cereal and lots of yummy stuff, but also a poison which kills them very quickly. And so the helicopters were used to fly around the island. You can see this yellow one in the middle. And if you look just underneath it, you can see the bucket hanging underneath it that's flying, spreading the, um, the bait out. If you look carefully, you can see the little granules being thrown out. And by flying up and down in very careful lines, all up and down the non-glacial, the non-icy parts of the island, they were able to spread the bait out at a rate where they were hoping that every rat, and a rat has a home territory of about 200 meters so as long as there's a, a, a small handful of, of bait available every couple of hundred meters the, the hope was that the rats would find them all and eat them and not survive so we now had to wait two years because after two years if just one or two rats had survived then that would be the time it would take for them to breed right back up in an area so that we could detect them so two years later we came back and it was time for a monitoring project, which I was very lucky to be part of. So I spent six months on the island over the, su the southern summer. So that's from October to March in 2017, 2018. Part of a team of about 15 people who hunted around to see if we could find any rats. Sometimes we were based on ships, big ships. Um, the first boat I was on was this tiny little yacht, which was quite challenging in the um, waters around the island. And we used the boat to get ashore into many, many places to have a good look around. So how do you look for rats? Well, you can walk around and look and see if you can find them, but you're not likely to. So we, we used some devices instead. This is the very first monitoring station we put in. So this is the wooden stake with a few little yummy things attached to it. Rats love peanut butter. So we put some car corrugated cardboard down with peanut butter jammed up and we put out little wax tags which were infused with peanut butter and even the wooden stakes had a, a, had a very delicious um, oil painted onto them. So the idea being that if the rats saw something here they'd have a good chew and we would know they'd been there. So here's what a, a, a wax tag would look like if a rat chewed it. You can see these very distinctive front tooth marks. Now the front teeth of rats 
grow all the time so they have to keep gnawing and chewing so that they can keep the, the, the teeth to a certain length and on an island without trees if you put a nice chewy bit of wood down then they love to gnaw into that and do their teeth some you know, preventive maintenance so we put out thousands of these all over the island and it was great it was it was hard work but you got to cover the island and you could see Gen 2 penguin colonies, the king penguin colonies, all the seals. We saw lots and lots of wildlife, which is a very, very special thing to see. And as Stuart said, every every, every now and then you get a really rare light coloured fur seal. And they're much, well, don't don't say it in front of the dark coloured ones because they, they they might get a bit of a complex about it. But the, the, the blonde ones are even cuter. And uh, here's one feeding. So after three months, we put out... Oh, over a thousand monitoring stations in hundreds of sites all around the island and we'd left them for a while to let the rats get used to it and then it was time to go back and check them on yet another boat and this time we were joined by our secret weapon three specially trained dogs Ahu, Wai and Will came from New, Ze New Zealand and again the, it was exp expensive job that uh, Ahu on the left had to be bought and trained specifically for this project which again the heritage trust um, did a lot of fundraising and managed that and so these dogs are trained specifically to hunt for rats they've got very very fine sense of smell and they get very very excited because they're trained to expect a lovely a lovely treat from their handler and they're also very well trained that they completely ignored the wildlife they would never chase penguins they would never chase seals you can see the little fur seal having a go at will here who's just being very grown up and adult and ignoring it amongst the plants there's this little stickly burr the burnet and the, the seed pods get into your socks get into your shoes into the trouser cuffs and if you're a dog down at that level gets into your fur but the dogs loved if every evening having the having a good groom and getting the seeds back out they didn't really mind so as we went round while the dogs were looking we were checking all the stakes the chew boards and the wax tags and we found no signs of chewing on any of them which we were quite frankly very pleased and very amazed at and while we were going around we also carried out um bird surveys and i've put this picture in of my boss dickie the project manager it wasn't always sunshine and lovely days. You can see it's quite wet and rainy, but we would still sit down at every spot we went to, so two or three times a day, and for five minutes count any small birds that we saw just to see if there were any. And after 25 years, I had a feel for how many birds I would expect to see. And on this, we saw so many, so many more than we would expect to see. The ducks, where you'd expect to see maybe one or two from time to time, on a little lake like this, hundreds. That was much more than I'm used to seeing. And this is really good news. And we could see the, the South Georgia pintail duck walking around in bright daylight, daylight right out in the open with a big bunch of chicks that they, of ducklings that they were raising, something I'd never seen before, not in all my time on the island. And the little pipit that hides away inside the, the tussock, just at rat, rat level, they're now able to lay their eggs without the eggs being taken and we found little chicks and the parents flying to and fro getting as many of those wonderful insects as they could and because the rats will also eat insects there seemed to be more insects available so a double win there so the pipits every single one of the 100 mainland sites that we visited we found pipits and they would not have been there before. So we were pretty sure, but we had to persuade an independent panel of experts. So the excitement over after six months is back home to report writing, map preparation and waiting. And at last in May, 2018, we heard that the panel had decided that they were satisfied and the island was officially free of rodents, which is an amazing, amazing project. And since then, sightings of birds continue to increase and this is a great example of how it is possible to reverse some of the mistakes that we've made by introducing things where they don't belong it is possible to reverse that and very soon get some amazing results and leave the place as a much much better place as it should be so that's that um thanks very much all right. Well, Pat, that is such a great story. It is an amazing conservation story. 
And it really illustrates quite well the damage we can do to an ecosystem. Um, but at the same time, how resilient uh, nature and ecosystems can be. And it also shows how challenging and expensive it can be to kind of undo some of that damage. So it really is quite an amazing success story. Yeah, it is. And you're quite right. It, it's much, much easier to not introduce something in the first place than to go back and fix it afterwards. So we, with all the people that we take down to the island now and to the Antarctic, um, and all visitors, scientists, people who work there, they all have to go through very strict what we call biosecurity protocols. So we check all of our equipment, make sure that our walking boots don't have seeds in them from the last place we visited, make sure that our bags and cargo going into the island doesn't have insects in it, doesn't have soil, which might have strange bacteria, and no rats have got into cargo or any ships. So there's a lot of effort, but it's a lot less effort than it is to actually get rid of something if it um, accidentally gets in and starts breeding. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to bring Stu back in. We can even pop Allison back in here for a few moments. Uh, what we'll do, because we're going to announce uh, a new contest shortly uh, and a few more contest winners for another contest. But before that, we should mix in a little Q&A time. So we've got some great classrooms on camera with us. There's some classrooms turning in via YouTube. So use that chat sidebar, pop in a few questions for us, and we'll pop in a few uh, of our camera classrooms as well. So we're gonna start off, I'm gonna bring in Miss Painter's crew joining us in Virginia, uh, in Salem. Looks like some eighth graders and I think a couple winners from our Kahoot today. So let's bring them in here. Oh, I have a question. Hey, Virginia. Hey, uh, I'm good. And ask your question. Um, so I have a question. So the question is, have you ever found any like ancient artifacts in these outdoors? <laughs> All right. So, are there any old artifacts or any ancient artifacts to be found on South Georgia? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, well, people have only been on the island since Captain Cook bumped into it in 1775. So, it doesn't have ancient artifacts like old caves with paintings or fossils of human activity going back very far at all. Um, so what we found, what we call history for South Georgia is the human history just of the last couple of hundred years. So the early sealers, then the whalers, and then from 1982 onwards, there was a brief military occupation, science work that goes on. And so there are, there are artifacts from those places dotted around and they're being slowly documented, but nothing really, really going way back into time. All right, uh, we're gonna jump to Mexico. We've got a group of ninth graders hanging out with us in Mexico. So I'm gonna bring them in right now. There we go. Hey, ninth graders, how we doing? Hi. Uh, hi. hi, I have a question. Um, apart from South uh, Georgia, there is, another, there is another place that you know there are these kind of animals that only live in one place. Okay, good question. So they're wondering, we mentioned we heard about endemic species found only yes. in South Georgia. Does that occur in other places around the world too? Well, that's yes. actually a, oh, oh, sorry. No, go that, that, That's actually a really, really good question. The answer is definitely yes. There's ecosystems in all types of different habitats from mountaintops to, to different unique parts of river systems to of course islands. And one of the next Nature Hour sessions in the next few weeks is exactly on that subject. It looks at remote islands around the world, tropical ones, and all the way down to the subantarctic as well, and how animals evolve in unique ways on those islands. Some animals get big, some animals get small, some animals become flightless, like those flies that you saw in South Georgia. Um, but islands are, are like engines of evolution. So islands are some of the best places in the world to find unique species. So that's a really good question. And the answer is definitely yes. All right, very cool. I'm gonna grab one from the YouTube chat here. So we've got Miss Collins crew joining us. They are in Fergus, Ontario. So here in Canada. Uh, and they're curious, are there any people who live full time on, on South Georgia? 
Will I answer that one, Pat? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, although Pat and his wife were actually on South Georgia living for a long time, they weren't permanent residents. They were working first for the government and then also they've been working for the South Georgia Heritage Trust. So actually on South Georgia itself, there aren't normal houses at all. There's the museum and there's a base where the scientists stay and also where some of the, the government people stay. And so everybody that comes to the island who's a tourist, they really have to stay on the cruise ships because there aren't any hotels or anything like that. And to actually get to the island, you have to go by ship because there's so little kind of shore land uh, or flat land that there isn't any kind of a airway, airstrip or anything like that. So to actually to get to South Georgia, you have to go by sea and that can take four or five days on some pretty bumpy waves. All right, another great question. So we're gonna go on a little journey now to Michigan. We're gonna head to Michigan in the US, some sixth graders with Miss Maxwell. Let me bring them into the conversation. Hey, sixth graders, how we doing? Oh, we have another camera. <laughs> yeah, it looks like the camera froze, but that's okay. We can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, um, um, what was the most amount of birds that you have counted? Oh, the, yeah, the question is, the, the most number of birds. Well, on the little surveys we did, we didn't see... Lot thousands and thousands at any one time, um, but yeah, well, remember, of course, penguins are birds. So, at St. Andrew's Bay on South Georgia is the largest king penguin colony in the world, and that's hundreds of thousands of king penguins that come up. So, that's probably the most birds I've seen. The most flying birds on South Georgia, I would say is probably the pintail ducks. We saw of a flock which we thought was probably about 200. Okay, very cool. And it's, I mean, it's great to hear how quickly those numbers came back. It must be so rewarding to find the nests, to see, you know, being excited, maybe seeing a couple in the past, now seeing a hundred uh, of the pintails. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, and actually in the future, we're going to have different ways, we hope, of counting those birds, actually using satellites that are going to be able to take photos. And then, you know, with huge numbers of birds like that, we'll actually be able to get a much better idea of how those birds are recovering now that the rats and mice aren't there any longer. All right. Let's bring in another Canadian crew here. We've got Miss Stone's crew hanging out with us. I believe they're sixth graders in Cambridge. Yeah, we're all here. How are we doing, sixth graders? Oh, yeah. You yeah, have a big crew. Yes, I do have a big crew. <laughs> big crew. All right, we're ready for you. I, I'm not sure that we have any questions other than we, we we wanted to get a better definition of the word endemic, if we could hear a slightly more kid-friendly maybe definition of what the word endemic means. Okay, so endemic means a species that is found in an area and nowhere else in the world. So for example, um, there are many endemic species in Canada that are found only in Canada and nowhere else in the world. So you could say that species is endemic to Canada. That, that would be a, a classic definition of it. All right. And it could be, you know, it doesn't have to be just a whole country. It could be a, one little yeah. ecosystem, right? One little part of that. Absolutely. Some animals and plants are endemic to found only in tiny areas. I discovered one in South America that is known literally from one tiny mountaintop that's about 50 meters by 50 meters, or for mm. American friends, about 150 foot by 150 foot. And that's the entire habitat in the world for that one, that one plant. That one's a carnivorous sundew, and it occurs nowhere else on earth, only there. So it's very, it's hyper endemic, hyper localized. Yeah. All right. And some some of the the birds that were saved when the rats and mice were removed from South Georgia, they're endemic too. So that means that actually doing that work, we managed to save entire species from extinction. So it just goes to show, you know, that 
you know, it is possible to actually reverse some of that damage and, you know, really make a difference and just like normal people as well as scientists and all the tourists and people like you and your parents, they all contributed to make that happen. So, you know, we did it as a team together and it is possible to actually make, make the world a better place. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to tuck Pat and Allison backstage for now. Classrooms, thank you for getting those great questions to us to start out. And Stu, you are going to introduce our next speaker because before we announce the new contest, we have a couple more winners from a, a contest with Roots and Shoots. That's absolutely right. So um, um, it connected to, to the, the resource boxes in which we sent out the South Georgia uh, resource packs. We also included a pack of gigantic sunflower seeds and schools across the UK have been growing these. And we have now some uh, the wonderful Jasmina from Roots and Shoots, which is from Jane Goodall's Institute um, here in the UK. And she's going to announce the winners of these, com these competitions. So over to you, Jasmina. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to be joining you today. And thank you for having me. And it was so lovely to learn more about South Georgia and all the amazing, uh, amazing spaces living there. I am delighted that I'll be the one announcing the winners from the Sunflower competition. We did together with uh, Don Hansen Charitable Trust and um, each school in the UK that received the Hansen box had, as Stu said, these amazing giant sunflowers and we have some incredible entries. I've got here Mr. A Jr. And any of you who knows who Dr. Jane Goodall is, she knows she carries the big version of this little of this little guy and I have him here for support while announcing the winners. I shall share my screen now. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. And I'm going to start with the runner ups, but I just wanted to say that what an incredible competition that was, because not only it was the Britain, I think it's much brighter and more beautiful, thanks to all these sunflowers being grown, but what fun it looks on the photos of all these schools growing these amazing sunflowers and truly giant, some of them. So we are going to start with St. Mary's Infant School in Fresham, which grew some quite tall sunflowers, over two meters tall. Um, each and every runner-up is going to get 50 pounds of an Amazon voucher that they can use towards any educational resources in the school. We also have another, another one of St. Mary's just to see how tall exactly they are. I think this is incredible. We have King's Rice Academy, also grown quite tall sunflowers. That, as you can see, the bees are enjoying, were enjoying already. And they grew quite a few of those, so the pollinators must be loving it. Some very happy growers here, showing just how tall the sunflowers were. Salisbury Primary School also grew quite a few big um, sunflowers, and they're also going to get a prize, very well deserved. Here is another photo of the beautiful sunflowers. We've got quite another tall one uh, from St. Saviour's uh, Church of England Primary. Well done. Hutton Henry Church of England Primary School and a very ha happy little girl showing us their very, very tall sunflower. Well done to everyone at Hutton Henry. Court Lane Junior School. What a lovely collage here showing us I don't even know how many sunflowers are in here. I'm guessing they grew the whole pack, which was about 50 of them. So well done to everyone involved. Now here we have um, Arbe um, Arberesha from Eastbury Community School. Um, the photo was submitted by her teacher, Tracy Knight. And I must say, this was one of the funniest one we've got. So thank you. Um, Nicola... Broad uh, submitted this one on behalf of Livingston Primary School, another worthy award winner. Melanie Deasy um, submitted this on behalf of St. James RC Primary. And look at how beautiful they look in the school garden. 
Dan Spinks submitted this one, as you can see, already ha still hard working on those, and they're quite tall and beautiful. And I completely agree with Claire Smith, who submitted the Latterland School um, photos, that reading helps me grow. I think reading helps us all grow, and uh, these sunflowers are a proof of that. And this one grew up to 2.5 2 meter tall, which is incredible. And of course, one of them having lots of fun decorating around the sunflower, which is absolutely beautiful. St. Peter's and St. Paul's RC Primary School and some very happy looking growers are also going to uh, get an award and is very well deserved one. And this one is an extraordinary um, sunflower and it's absolutely beautiful. It's called a crestate flower. Thank you, Stu. And Marie Law submitted this on behalf of Langley Primary School. Um, and it's what a beautiful sunflower. Now we go to the third, second, and first place and hope everyone will agree that all of these were incredible sunflowers with so much work has gone into growing this and I'm sure that there was so much fun. So third place goes to Langley Primary School and this absolutely beautiful sunflower, which as you can see, the bee completely agrees that it's very well worth it growing it. So thank you for also supporting our UK pollinators. Second place and 150 pounds of Amazon voucher goes to King's Rice Academy and this gigantic sunflower. Look at that. This is incredible. And I am just so pleased with the results. And first place, drum roll, goes to Trinity St. Mary's Church of England VA Primary School. They're going to get very well deserved 200 pounds of Amazon vouchers for growing this magnificent sunflowers. I mean, look at how happy these little ones look. I think that says it all. And these sunflowers are absolutely incredible. Thank you, Stu and Don, Don Hansen Charitable Foundation for making this competition possible, to working together with Roots and Shoots on making Britain brighter. And obviously, all of our pollinators love sunflowers. So I'm sure that that was a very good summer for them. Um, and thank you for having me today. I shall drop um, the Roots and Shoots website here in the UK in the chat box. Um, but also the program is in over 60 countries around the world. So if any of you is interested in joining and helping animals environment the community, please feel free to email me. I'll put the email on the chat box as well, and I'll be happy to connect you. All right. Wow. wow. Those uh, those first place ones were massive. Those were giant. I, I just, it, we, we just couldn't not give it to these little, little children that have done such an incredible job. I think every single every single entry was absolutely incredible and it was really really hard to judge Stuart can obviously vouch for that we <laughs> had to we had to and i think it's fantastic when there are so many runners up as well because we get the chance to reward as many as possible and i must say i mean everyone talks about the weather in britain we actually had a very hot summer but of course that also dried up so much of the habitat so those sunflowers were very very well welcomed and um, i have a few seeds which i'm going to be growing next year here in our oh. garden because i think it's just going to make life more beautiful oh absolutely well it's jasmina thank you so much for joining us today and announcing those winners really exciting my pleasure entirely all right we'll tuck you backstage for now Stu, we've got something to announce. We've got a contest to talk about today. We do. Um, so we've got two last elements of our program today. Um, we had a mini competition that was only announced on Monday. Every Nature Hour event, uh, the week before the Nature Hour event, we do a mini competition to win a special nature-related prize. Sometimes it's a mini jungle. Today, it's a colony of special stick insects. Um, we've had many schools draw their favorite insects and the little stick insects you can get, they're called jungle nymphs. They're bright green and they're absolutely beautiful. They're perfect for showing your class 
um, the, the beauty of camouflage and how amazing insects are. And in fact, in the next Hansen box that we're sending out to thousands of schools, there's a book specifically on camouflage. So the winning school, um, which we're about to announce to, in a few minutes time, uh, has won an entire setup with a cage of these beautiful little stick insects with a mister, a heat pad, a light panel and everything you need to look after them. So we hope that they'll make your classroom even more exciting and even more interesting. If it's okay, I'll just share my screen and very briefly we'll, we'll go through the winners and then announce the winners. And then the last element of our program today is talking about the upcoming Darwin 200 global voyage aboard the Ustaskilde and the, the upcoming visit to South Georgia. So if it's okay, um, Joe, I'll just share my screen and hopefully you can then, can you see that? Is that coming through okay? Just loading up now, yeah. Beautiful, okay. All righty, so a big, big thank you. We've had literally hundreds of entries come through over the last couple of days. We've only got time to show a few of them, but a big congratulations to the Arlyth Primary School in Scotland. Some amazing butterflies and ladybirds that have been, that have been drawn uh, by these students. So big, big congratulations to, to all of these beautiful, beautiful entries. Um, we've also had some very exciting ones from, from Oak Ridge School in High Wycombe. Um, sorry, I've got a stick insect crawling over my, my shoulder right now. I'll just get him. And um, uh, some brilliant stag beetles and grasshoppers and praying mantises, also from Wooten uh, House International School. These are very, very good drawings and a big congratulations, including these, these, I think this is a stick mantis um, as well, and a bee obviously here, and a beautiful dead leaf mantis, and an orchid mantis as well. Well, we decided these three schools all deserve a 50, um, a 50 pound voucher because these drawings are so fantastic. So I'm going to contact each school and we'll, we'll send those out now. But the winning entry of all, that's won the stick and set culture, um, we thought without a doubt, the winning entry was this, uh, this, this creative drawing slash creation of a philium leaf insect. I've, I've personally kept these this particular species and this is so accurate. So a big, big, big congratulations to the class of teacher Debbie Jones or Miss Jones, I should say, um, for winning this, this prize. So I'll be in contact with you and I'll personally deliver your very own culture of these beautiful insects. We really hope they brighten up your classroom. Well, the last element for our program today is to go back to South Georgia and the wonderful team at the South Georgia Heritage Trust and just talk very, very quickly about an upcoming event. This is a little way off. It's in 2024. So two, sorry, 2024, so two years away. So it's got a little bit of a wait for this event. But as you know from the resource boxes we've been sending in previous lectures, a spectacular historic ship called Ussuskilde is sailing around the world following in Charles Darwin's footsteps. And we're undertaking 100 events around the world, beaming live from locations from Tahiti all the way down to, to, um, to New Zealand and Australia and everywhere you can imagine in between. So we really hope you'll be part of these, these events in partnership with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. The spectacular ship is actually visiting uh, South Georgia. These are some photos from a previous visit to Antarctica and South Georgia, which Esther Skildane undertook. And as I say, we're gonna be visiting South Georgia and on board, we're actually bringing a satellite upload system. Now these things are a bit temperamental, particularly at sub Antarctic latitudes, but we're going to try beaming live from South Georgia so we'd love your schools to take part in this event and we can actually show you the penguins, the seals and these amazing glacial landscapes actually in real time by a satellite feed from, from the island. We're also going to be undertaking um, a, a water study around South Georgia and a pollution study to see if, if the plastics that are released into the ocean actually get all the way down to the Southern Ocean and if we can identify where they've drifted from. So it'll be a really interesting program of research as well. But we really, really, really hope that you'll enjoy our, um, our live event from South Georgia in 2024. So a big, big, big congratulations to all schools that have taken part in these different competitions and, and events. And I've got my little friend here again. 
I'll be in contact with the winning school um, high, in High Wycombe uh, to deliver these this 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 prize, which is an entire culture of these beautiful little insects. Next next month we have um, a mini jungle to give away. Um, so we really hope that you'll take part in the competitions uh, for, uh, upcoming. I'll be sending mail outs to the entire school program list so everyone can take part if they'd like to. And a big, big thank you. Just to let you know what's coming up on the horizon, we're going to the Falkland Islands to see some incredible wildlife uh, over in the Falklands um, from the world's biggest um, albatross colony all the way through to more penguins and more seals. I just catch my little friend again. He's quite adventurous today. As well as remote islands such as uh, Ascension and St. Helena, the mainland of Brazil, as well as the lost worlds of Venezuela and the spectacular lava lakes and sulfur landscape of Ethiopia. So we really, really hope you'll join uh, these nature hours in partnership with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants over the coming weeks. And a huge thank you from my side for joining today. So we really hope you enjoyed this, this nature hour event. All right, Stu. Well, thank you to you for helping put this together. The Darwin 200 is such an epic journey. I'll share the link here for anyone who wants to start following along. And we're just ramping up with these nature hours to get classrooms excited and exploring. I want to do a huge shout out to all the classrooms who joined us today. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Thank you for playing the Kahoot with us. Uh, and congratulations to all the contest winners. So cool. And we have to bring in our guests today as well. It's Jasmina and Allison back in here with us live. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you for the work your organizations are doing. It was an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's been really lovely being along. Thanks very much. All right. Well, I guess we'll sign off for today and we'll see you during the next Nature Hour. So thanks so much, everybody. Oh. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for coming.